Woods Parish in Massapequa Park, New York. I'm Monsignor Jim Losanti welcoming you to our celebration today of the baptism of the Lord. Please join me in praying in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Dear friends, the Lord be with you. And with your spirit. To better celebrate Mass, let's take a moment of peace and silence to examine our lives and to confess our sins. For the times we have failed to give good example to those who most look to us, especially our children, our grandchildren, our nieces, our nephews, our family, Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. For the times we've spoken in anger, with unkindness, a lack of charity, Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. For the good we intend to do but never accomplish, the sins of omission, Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. And may Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us all to everlasting life. Amen. faithful to our own baptismal promises. Almighty and eternal God, when the Spirit descended upon Jesus at his baptism in the River Jordan, you revealed him as your own beloved Son. Keep us, your children, born of water and the Spirit, always faithful to our calling. And we ask this through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. Thus says the Lord, Here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one with whom I am pleased, upon whom I have put my spirit. He shall bring forth justice to the nations, not crying out, not shouting, not making his voice heard in the street. A bruised reed he shall not break, and a smoldering wick he shall not quench until he establishes justice on the earth the coastlands will wait for his teaching i the lord have called you for the victory of justice i have grasped you by the hand i formed you and set you as a covenant of the people a light for the nations 
to open the eyes of the blind, to bring out prisoners from confinement and from the dungeon those who live in darkness. The word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be to God. God. of the apostles. Peter proceeded to speak to those gathered in the house of Cornelius, saying, In truth, I see that God shows no partiality. Rather, in every nation, whoever fears him and acts uprightly is acceptable to him. You know the word that he sent to the Israelites as he proclaimed peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. What has happened all over Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism, that John preached how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power. He went about doing good and healing all those oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Lord, be in my heart and on my lips that I might worthy to claim your gospel for the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Friends, the Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Glory, Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan River to be baptized by John. John tried to prevent him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and yet you are coming to me? And Jesus said to him in reply, Allow it now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. And then he allowed him. After Jesus was baptized, he came up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened for him. 
And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming upon him. And a voice came from the heavens saying, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. And this is the Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Great to be with you on this occasion of the baptism of the Lord. And each of the readings gives us a particular challenge for these challenging times we live in. Let's go right away to the Old Testament, the book of Isaiah. Here, I think, is the key line for us to focus on today. God, who is generous and forgiving, for his thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways his ways. Let's focus on one particular way that God's ways and our ways may not be the same. I think for a lot of us, we get kind of a a source of agreement with the whole notion of an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. I've had so many people say, well, my point of view has always been, if somebody hits you, you hit them harder back again and again. And in fact, if you ever have seen the musical Fiddler on the Roof, you know there's a scene where uh, the Jewish community rising up against the Russians for persecuting them, the cry is, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, and the response is, then the whole world will be blind and toothless. And that's the truth. God wants us to deal with the fact that our human nature is inclined toward a desire for revenge. I've said many times before, I think when it comes to capital punishment, while some of us will argue that it's a matter of justice, the reality is for many of us it's much more about revenge. You hurt us, you hurt someone we love, you must pay the penalty. We're going to get you back for what you did. That, that interest in revenge is a very natural thing. It's part of all of our nature, whether it's for big stuff like life and death or just wanting to get someone back for any meanness or unkindness or lack of charity they may have demonstrated to us. Our ways are not God's ways. And he would say to us, when we're most inclined to seek revenge, don't. I'll give you an example from my own life. Years ago, uh, part of my job was to go around and teach different aspects of church teaching, uh, ethics, morality. One of the parishes I was in one time was to give a talk on capital punishment and the death penalty. So I laid out everything that the church says about why it's not a good thing and why the person should be given imprisonment but not put to death. And I think I was somewhat convincing in presenting the church's thought. We took a break, and during the break I called home only to find out that one of my sisters in New York City had gotten on a subway around lunchtime and had not come back to work without explanation. Immediately your mind races to what if something happened to her. And I remember so distinctly having just given this wonderful talk in the morning about the importance of turning the other cheek and not giving in to that desire to kill those who hurt us, that I remember thinking, if anybody hurt my sister, I will kill the son of a gun. So, you know, on the one hand, intellectually, I can make the case against capital punishment. But on the other hand, my first impulse was, you hurt somebody I love, I'm going to hurt you. And what I was doing was perfectly normal and human, but God calls us to better. He says, look, my ways and your ways are not the same, but it would be a whole lot better for you in the world if your ways became more like mine. Do you have a desire for revenge? Do I have that inclination? Do we still find that we want to wish ill on those who have hurt us? And then how, in God's name then, do we go to a God and say, I'm so grateful for your mercy. I know that no matter what I do, no matter what my sins are, you forgive and you forget. How do we take from God his mercy but fail to offer that mercy to other people? God's ways are not our own, but wouldn't it be great for you and me and mankind if we could find a way to align our ways and God's ways? He sees beyond revenge. He sees beyond getting even to mercy, charity, and yes, if you will, turn the other cheek. I confess to you, I'm still not great at it. I still sometimes am inclined to want to pay back for what I get. But I know in my heart of hearts, when I have that feeling, that very human feeling, that I'm wrong. And that I'd be happier and more peaceful if I align myself with God and God's ways. Let's go now to something I think equally important, that second reading from the first letter of St. John. For the love of God, he writes, is this, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. Here's what I think St. John is saying to us. You know how you and I think, oh my God, it must be so hard to be totally good all the time, you know? How can anybody be good all the time? We are constantly just believing that our human condition is that we are meant to live in sin. And once in a while we rise above it, but it's too hard to be good. St. John says just the opposite. 
He says sin is the burden. And living without sin, living by God's commands, is freedom. And there's a great logic to that when you think about it. You know, think about when you lie, right? If you, you tell a lie, you got to keep the lie going and cover it up again and again and dress it up and make it more palatable. You have to in some way sell this lie, whereas if from the beginning we tell the truth, there's nothing to cover up, no energy expended in trying to cover up for the wrong. You steal, you feel bad about it. You covet somebody, you want somebody's wife or husband. You're feeling guilt and remorse and you know it's not going to end well. All those sins in the Ten Commandments, the truth is that when we sin, we're constantly burdened by the sin. And we know we're carrying a burden that's not going to make us better people. But what St. John is saying is if you try, and I try, to live a good life and to obey the commands and to do the right thing, almost always we're going to be burdened less and we're going to actually be upheld by a God who says, isn't life less complicated when you're not sinning? You know, I, I deal all the time in counseling with either husbands or wives who may have gotten involved with other people who are not their wives or husband. And the one thing they tell me is time and time again how exhausting it is to keep all the balls in the air, you know, to keep all the, the guilt and the sin and the double dealing, the double life that they live. And it's really much simpler to go home, work it out with your wife or husband, forgive past indiscretions and move forward and not try to give in to that need to live the life of sin and carry that burden, but rather, as St. John says, to be freed from that. Following the Ten Commandments, it's the way to freedom. It's an unburdened way to live. Let me give you another example. I've shared enough here at these homilies about my relationship with my parents. You know, people say, oh, it's remarkable that you and your sisters do so much for your mom as we did for my dad, too. Just the opposite is true. One of my sisters said to me recently, you know, one day mommy's going to go home to heaven, and isn't it great that we're going to be able to get up that morning and know that we did every single thing we could to give her dignity and respect and love and to uphold her and take care of her. And that's the truth. So when we're told by the commandments, you know, honor your father and your mother, sounds like a burden. It's not. In fact, just the opposite is true. I've dealt for years with people who weren't there for their parents, who didn't love them when they should, who hadn't been forgiving a parent's mistakes along the way and carried that anger or that resentment. And then when the parents die, they're filled with remorse, guilt, the woulda, shoulda, couldas. I'm telling you, and I, I think I speak for me and my sisters, it's a whole lot easier, a whole lot less burdensome to do the loving thing, to be the loving person, to obey the command. The commands of God are not hard. Living without those particular commands, living in a world of sin, that's where the burden lies. I don't want to be burdened throughout my life by carrying my sins, neither do you. There's a way out. It's called simply doing what God commands and knowing that when you do that, you are free, you are liberated, you are upheld. You can take a breath and feel like, I did what I was supposed to, I'm not trying to cover up for anything, I'm doing the right thing, and God, is that a free and wonderful way to live our lives? Let's go finally to the gospel. Um, the baptism of the Lord. This can get a little bit confusing. The baptism of John the Baptist, the reason he was baptizing people, was a baptism of repentance, that you have a life of sin, you come into the water, John washes you clean of the sin, and you get a new beginning. Okay, so what's Jesus doing going into the river? He doesn't sin. What's he going in for the baptism of repentance? Even our own baptism. You know, our baptism in the Catholic Church is not the same as what John is doing because there's much more to our baptism. Our baptism certainly is about wiping away sin, original sin, but it's more than that. It's also about membership. We become part of the body of Christ, the church. Well, Jesus is the church. He is the body of Christ. So he doesn't need our baptism. He doesn't need John's baptism. What's he doing in the river? Why did Jesus go in? And I would suggest to you that what Jesus was doing that day is what you and I are called on to do every single day, which is to give good example. If I, he's saying to us, who am without sin and willing to go into the river, everyone knows this, this washing in the river is to get rid of sin. I don't have sin, but I'm going to do it anyway because I want to model for others what we're supposed to do. And you know, you and I have that opportunity all the time. We have a chance, we have a, a choice to, to do the right thing and in doing that to show other people what life in Christ is all about or not. And we make that difference for others. Believe me, people are watching you, people are watching me. They see our inconsistencies. They see the things we call people to live that we're not living ourselves, the hypocrisies. But Jesus had none of that. He decided there's no better role modeling 
No better way to teach than by doing it myself. Did he need to go into the river to become a member of the church? No, he is the church. Did he go to wash away sin? No, he's sinless. What did he do it for? He did it to say, if I, who don't have to go into the river, am willing to go into the river, it's my way of teaching you, come, be forgiven, be cleansed, begin again, get rid of the sin. Jesus models time and time again, not by telling us this is what you got to do, but by saying, watch me. Watch the kindness, the mercy, the goodness. Watch how I embrace the people that society rejects. And when you're inclined to block out some people in your life because they're not your kind of people, you got to look in the face of Jesus and say, what did he do? What would Jesus do? And the truth is, so often we find ourselves saying, but what I'm doing is not what he would do. And our real peace is to follow the model, the example that he gives, and importantly, to be that model for others. You know, uh, I was thinking about my own life and the life of my siblings. We love God so much. We love our country so very much. We are, we are reminded that part of loving our country is also being full of God's mercy. America, the most generous country in the world. You know, going back to that first reading on revenge, I was thinking, you know, that after World War I, all the allies ganged up on Germany and punished Germany unmercifully, leading to the rise of Hitler because the German people were so dispirited. At the end of the Second World War, actually manifesting the mercy and the love of God, what do we do? We could have punished the Japanese and the Germans for their horrible, horrible war that they had waged. Didn't happen. America helped to rebuild those countries in beautiful and wonderful ways. And today, half a century or more later, Germany and Japan are flourishing, progressive, wonderful societies. And guess what? They're also some of our closest allies. Because given the chance to either stick it to them or love them into a new creation, we did the right thing. Our model during World War II at the end of the war was to love, to forgive, and to rebuild. And in the same way in your life and mine, we are called on to love, to forgive, to be merciful. I went back to saying to you, I love God, I love my country, I try to love people. Where did I get that from? Where did my sisters get that from? We got it from our parents who actually did always show us that they loved God dearly, that they treasured this country of ours, and that they tried their best to love every person that God put in their path. I don't think my sisters and I got to be, if we are any good, good alone. We got it through the modeling of our parents who taught us by doing. In the same way, Jesus in this gospel says, I'm walking into the river, not because I have sinned to wash away, but to show you, come and follow me. Do not as I say, but do as I do. And in that, we live as he would have us live. Final thoughts having nothing to do with Scripture, but you'd have to know that I talk about this this week. I may have shared with you before, back in 1968, I was working for Senator Gene McCarthy as a volunteer in his run for the presidency. The essence of his campaign was to stop our involvement in the war in Vietnam. And I went to the Chicago Democratic National Convention to help out as a volunteer on the campaign, and saw the incredible violence I'd never seen before. The rioting in the streets between the police and the protesters, those who were for the war, those who were against the war, the violence, the bashing, the horrible tear gas. It was, it was awful. It was my first and, at that point, most awful experience. And it was wrong. It was lawlessness, and it was wrong. In the same way, you know, in the past year, we've watched some of these demonstrations that started for good cause to protect black lives turn into events of looting and crime and, and hurting other people. And when you see that, justice is not being served. It's just plain wrong. It's, wrong. it's lawlessness. In the same way, what happened in Washington this week, you can have your complaint, you can believe elections are fair or unfair, just or unjust, but once you move from complaining and standing up for your rights to say what you feel and turn instead to violence and lawlessness, you have compromised everything that you stand for. You've brought down the very essence of what you're arguing for, which is the greatness of America, by making us look like some kind of third world republic. We can do better, we're called on to do better. I knew back in Chicago in 1968, the lawlessness there was wrong. And the cause those people who were rioting for was compromised. In the same way, during the past year, didn't we watch when peaceful demonstrations turned into looting 
and beating up on innocent people and say, my God, they're compromising the most important issue, racial equality. And in the same way, when we watched Washington, D.C., we didn't stop and think, well, was the election fair or not? We thought, my God, what have we come to in this country that we think that it's acceptable to embrace the way of lawlessness? We are better than that. We are America. We stand to the whole world as a beacon of truth and hope for democratic ways of fighting the good fight. And when you lose, you lose. You accept it and you work for a better day. You don't embrace lawlessness. So I'd ask you to join with me throughout this Mass in praying for a resolution and new dialogue. Final story. Uh, just this week I had uh, a reporter from the New York Times on the show, personally speaking, that I host. Timothy Egan. He's written a book, interestingly enough, called Pilgrimage to Eternity, about his struggle to believe. Raised Catholic, but left the church for a long time. But his column in the New York Times, to be honest with you, it's very, very liberal, and you know my feelings on the New York Times anyway. I read it, but I probably disagree with Tim as much as I agree with him, probably more so. I mention that because in some ways, why would I have a guy like that on my show? Why am I going to talk to some liberal progressive with whom I disagree? Because that's the nature of our country, our democracy. You talk with people you disagree with, you try to work it out, you try to understand. Look, you know I'm thoroughly pro-life, but I spend so much time talking to people who are pro-choice, people who've gone through the experience of abortion. Will I ever come to believe that choice is the right one? No. But how in the world of God are we ever going to progress as a nation, as a people, without trying to listen to one another, debate if we have to, but always in the context of peace and mutual respect. At the end of the interview, Timothy Egan and I still didn't agree on everything. Nonetheless, we had engaged in the dialogue, and I have to say, I think for him, as for me, we were just a little bit wiser because we bothered to listen to the other side. We are called on as Christians and as Americans to do the same, to listen with hearts and minds to the other side. Disagree politely, respectfully, but never to give in to lawlessness, which only compromises our dignity, our worth, our value as a people of the greatest nation in the world. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father. Through him all things were made for us men and for our salvation. He came down from heaven and by the Holy Spirit was incarnate of the Virgin Mary and became man. For our sake he was crucified unto Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried and rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Now with confidence in the goodness of God, let's turn to the Lord our God with our prayers of petition. Our response would be, Lord, hear our prayer, that the church may effectively lead all people to acknowledge Christ as the Son of God. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer that nations may resolve their conflicts by seeking the justice and peace brought to the world by the Lord Jesus. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That the Christian community, made one by our common baptism, may always welcome the unborn, the stranger, and all who are vulnerable. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For the level two students in our religious education program, that their hearts will be open to the healing power of God as they prepare to receive the sacrament of first reconciliation next weekend. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That those in our parish and family members who are ill may enjoy the consolation of the Lord and the presence of their loved ones, especially Corinne Locke, James Lee, John Pisirillo, 
Loretta Bianco, Amparo Monsalve, Dan Bernard, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all who have died, especially Vicon Stephen Deligati, James J. Maguire, Arthur Hopman, Pauline Angerame, Diane O. Connor, Robert and John, Joan Cook, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For the intention of this Mass, Sal D. Agostino, Anne Marie Theresa Conroy, Elisede Nicholas, and Reverend Christian Nicholas, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Let me add a few more intentions for this Mass. We want to remember Marie Fischetti, Philomena Piero. Let's remember Suzanne Scanio. Uh, also the intentions of Deacon Fred and Barbara Ferrara, Samuel Zinn, Philomene Joachim Herse. Um, let me, as I do, mention a few private intentions of my own. I'm not making them private anymore, I guess. And you'll notice instead of these little note cards I normally hold, I have a book now for my intentions. I thank Faith and Luke and, and Mary for being so kind. They saw me struggling with note cards and got me a little book for my prayers. So for the sick, I pray for Billy Sarasoli. He's still in the hospital and fighting a good fight. Corinne Locke, my dear friend. For Barbara Turley, Babry Emily Quart. She's a preemie struggling with her own smallness. God bless her, protect her. Frank Kilgannon, Dorothy DeLisa. I pray for Thomas Lauer, five years old, struggling. Christopher Perry. I want to pray for all those who are struggling with addiction of any kind. For Kevin Shields, recovering from his brain surgery. For Michael Cataldi. For George Gill, uh, battling COVID. I pray for Michael Cardone down in Florida. Michael, sending you love and prayers. Noah Torelli, Laura Lishan, Georgie Ritter. Al Clemente, Al is doing better. Al, we're with you in prayer. Uh, Jean Lusich Dwyer, I want to pray for Laura Elizabeth Steele. I want to pray for Megan and Vinci Mercadiano. Also for Anthony Posterino and Tom O'Sullivan and my friend Vern. I pray too in a spirit of thanksgiving. You know, we've been praying for so many months for Stacy and her unborn child. Well, I'm happy to say he was born this week. And aside from a little... Uh, beaten up nose and coming out of his mom. He is doing just fine. So Henry Grayson, welcome into the world. We've been praying you to this moment. Pray for John and Roseanne Simone, Barbara Simone, Anthony Scotto, Heidi Ignoski, Van Tutwiler. Always I pray for my mom, Cecilia, Leanne Lasanti, for Ron Citrano, Howie Pomerantz, Sophia Maglione. Sophia up in Boston, we're with you every day in prayer. Um, for Jack Carroll and Joan Donovan, and Marilyn Arbogast and Nancy Palumbo. And I want to pray for my friend out in Iowa, Pat McTaggart. Also to pray for Melissa Bergman, Nick Castellano, Jorge Clemente, Anthony Ponte, for Jim Harmon and Judge Tony Falanga, for Peggy Maniscalco. Peggy, we're praying for you. For Jose Cruz, for Randy D'Amico, for my friend Jim Barr. I want to give uh, also Thanksgiving for uh, Bruce Parquet, his wonderful wife, Mary Kay, and their four beautiful children, the whole family afflicted with COVID, but they've come through it beautifully, thank God. And uh, as always, I want to pray for all public servants, um, for our police, our firefighters, those in the military, the EMTs, the doctors, the nurses, all those people on the first line that we need so very badly, praying especially for Thomas Scanio and Connor Lasanti. And now among those who have died, I'm going to remember a whole bunch of people. Be with me in patience, please. Pauline, uh, and your me, and she's our fourth year anniversary. For Bill Kelly, for Richard Rose Marin, for Lorraine and Ray Campbell, Nicholas and Sally Cordero, Michael Ciroli, Sarasoli, for John Maureen and Ann Raber, for uh, Chuck DeHart and John Slade, for John and Alma Kappa, beautiful couple, Michael Manzella, Kenny Bolando, for Christina Formato and Cynthia Prague, Gaetano, Sal, and Angelo Emolo, Anthony Preziosi, my good friend, Pauline Romano, Mary and Charlie Nobile, Linda Nobile O'Brien. I pray for Billy Taylor, Robbie Purick. I pray for June and Ed Jandovitz, for Jimmy Saldo, Richard Jackal, Barry Champney, dear Barry, Eleanor Mazzi, Brian Hussey. And we had prayed before for Suzanne Scanio, his daughter. We pray for her again. Ronald Cacioppo, Kate Kelly, Connie and Sal Cusimano, Ted Scorsia, Jerry Monk, Dave Robin. Um, it's Dave whose wife and children gave me this wonderful book. He's uh, up in heaven now, Dave. Matthew Toriello, Vita Palmieri, Kathleen Smith, John Arturi, Connor and Will Robles, Mary Ann Hayes, Pat Cronin, Monica Kerrison. Dear Monica and her wonderful husband Ray still with us on earth. I want to pray too for uh, Regina Robinson, Joan and John Donnelly, 
Henry Meyer, I pray for Colin and Tommy Ryan, two brothers who passed away in the consolation of their parents. Monsignor John Alessandro, Monsignor Tom Condreva, I pray for Mary Rose and John Brosnan, for Leon Sherman Jr., for Marie Sicolo, Vincent Castoria Jr., Thomas O'Shea, Marie Austin, Emily LaFasso, George Floyd, Raymond Kennedy. Ah, we're not finished. We keep going for my friends who have passed from this life to the next. I hope are praying for us in heaven. Tracy Wachowski, beautiful Tracy. Joe and Marion Bacigalupo, Alex Haliasas, young, beautiful man who passed away this, this past week. I want to pray, too, for Marvin Klein, for Jerry and Edward Casal, for Judge Don Belfi, great man, Tina DiBello, Joe and Joan Largan, Ed Almer, Paul Stashut. I pray for Gary and Mike Scorcher, Nick Martone, Jerry and Michael Pangalo, Norma Calabrese, Bob Perez, John Glauder, for Marie Casavecchi, Scotty and Nina Passarelli, Scott Pollock, and his son Bubba, also with him in heaven, Ronnie Bedix, Joe and Peggy Bauman, Dale Louise Odom, Elmer Schantz, Pat Sestar, Peggy Barr, John McMacken, Raymond Hussey, Nicholas Lasanti, Father Joe Lukaszewski, Father Ken Marks, Father Tim Harton, Herton, Marilyn Salonia, Constantino Polio, Captain Tim Murray, Dottie Lauer, Rose Rosado, Joseph Lovett, Carol Lynn Duvall, Bob and Pat Caliban, I pray for Victor and Lillian, Bob and Margie, uh, Ethel and Barlow, Tom and Helen, and all of our relatives we pray are happy in heaven. Let's take a moment for you to think of, as I need to think of, some really private intentions, things we've been praying for that we ask of God. For peace in our country, for reason to reign, for a willingness to dialogue, for an end to all second-guessing and violence, for a country to come together for good purpose, we pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord hear our prayer. And we give all these intentions over to the Mother of God, to whom we now pray. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Blessed are you, Lord, God of all creation. Through your goodness we have this bread to offer, which earth has given and human hands have made. It will become for us the bread of life. Blessed be God forever. By the mystery of this water and wine, may we come to share in the divinity of Christ, who humbled himself to share in our humanity. Blessed are you, Lord, God of all creation. Through your goodness, we have this wine to offer. Fruit of the vine, work of human hands, it will become for us our spiritual drink. Blessed, Blessed be God, God forever. Lord. Lord God, we ask you to receive us and be pleased with the sacrifice we offer you with humble and contrite hearts. Lord, wash away my iniquity. Cleanse me from all of my sin. Pray, my brothers and sisters, that our sacrifice will be found acceptable to God, our Heavenly Father. May the Lord accept the sacrifice at our hands to the praise and the glory of his name for our good and the good of all his church. Lord, we celebrate the revelation of Christ, your Son, who takes away the sins of the world. Accept our gifts of bread and wine and let them become one with his sacrifice, for he truly is our Lord forever and ever. Amen. My friends, the Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. Lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Is right and just. Father, all powerful and ever, -live, ever living God, we dwell always and everywhere to give you thanks and praise. You celebrated your new gift of baptism by signs and wonders at the River Jordan. Your voice was heard from heaven to awaken faith in the presence among us of the Word made flesh. Your spirit was seen as a dove, revealing Jesus as your servant and anointing him with joy as the promised Christ, sent to bring to the poor the good news of salvation. In our unending joy, we now echo on earth the song of the angels in heaven as they praise your glory forever.
God of power, God of might, we praise you through your Son, Jesus Christ, who comes in your name. He is the word that brings salvation. He is the hand you stretch out to us who are sinners. He is the way that leads to your peace. God, our Heavenly Father, we've often wandered far from you, but through your Son, Jesus, you have brought us back. You gave him up to death so that we might turn again to you and find our way in love to one another. Therefore, we celebrate today the love and reconciliation Christ has gained for us. And we ask you, Father, to sanctify these gifts of bread and wine by the power of your Holy Spirit, so that they may become for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. While he was at supper on the night before he died for us, Jesus took bread in his sacred hands and gave you, Father, thanks and praise. He broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. When supper was ended, Jesus took a chalice filled with the fruit of the vine. Again, Father, he thanked you for your goodness, gave the chalice to his disciples and friends, and he said, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and everlasting covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. Let us proclaim the mystery of our faith. Lord our God, your Son has entrusted to us this pledge of his love. We celebrate the memory of his death and resurrection, and we bring you the gift you have given to us, this sacrifice of love and reconciliation. Therefore, we ask you, Father, to accept us together with your Son, fill us with his Spirit through our sharing in this meal, and may he take away all that divides us. May the same Spirit of love and unity bring us to communion of mind and heart with Francis our Pope, John our Bishop, along with all the bishops, the clergy, the religious, and all of God's people. Father, make your church throughout the world a sign of unity and an instrument of your peace. You've gathered us here today around the table of your son in fellowship with Mary, the Virgin Mother of God, with Saint Joseph, her devoted spouse, and all the saints. In that new world, where the fullness of your peace will be revealed, gather people of every race, every language, every way of life, to share in the one eternal banquet with Jesus Christ, who is our risen and our loving Lord. Through him, with him, in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours, almighty Father, forever and ever. I talked in the homily about how we're supposed to set a good example for others. I fail time and time again. We all do, right? We hope that we're sending out the right set message to people, but sometimes our lives compromise that message. So when we pray the Lord's Prayer today, let's make that our prayer, that we will live consistently the gospel we preach, that when our kids, our grandchildren, our nieces and nephews look at us, they'll see people who are not frauds or hypocrites, but people truly trying to live the best lives they can. For an ability to truly live what we say we believe, let's pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
Deliver us, Lord, from every evil and grant us peace in our day. In your mercy, keep us free from sin. Protect us from all anxiety as we wait in joyful hope for the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For, for the, the kingdom, kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, I leave you my peace, my peace I give to you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church and grant us the peace and unity of your kingdom where you live and reign, one God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. May the peace of the Lord be with you always. And with your spirit. Jesus Christ, with faith in your love and mercy, we eat your body and drink your blood. Let it not bring us condemnation, but health in mind and in body. My friends, behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those who are called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed. May the body and blood of Christ bring us all to share in everlasting life. Amen. An act of spiritual communion. My Jesus, I believe that you are present in the most holy sacrament. I love you above all things, and I desire to receive you into my soul. Since I cannot at this moment receive you sacramentally, come at least spiritually into my heart. I embrace you as if you were already there and unite myself wholly to you. Never permit me to be separated from you. Amen. You know, I, I like to do commercials, and uh, this is one of them. I hope you're watching, in addition to our Mass here, uh, Personally Speaking, where each week I get to interview different guests about what they believe, who they are, what they value most, people we thought we knew in public life but may not really know as people of faith. This week it's uh, Kathy Lee Gifford. Uh, next week it's going to be Galen Rupp, the Olympic runner, uh, talking about his Catholic faith. And then we just taped two shows this week that will come on soon. One of them I mentioned during the homily, Timothy Egan, a writer for the New York Times and a Pulitzer Prize-winning author of a great new book called uh, Pilgrimage to Eternity, about the struggle of a doubter to believe in his Catholic faith and to come home. Uh, a very revealing interview in so many ways. And then uh, in addition to that, we interviewed a Broadway star named Hunter Ryan Herlicka. He had starred in A Little Night Music and many other Broadway shows, but he talked about how difficult it was to be a, a, an active participant in the arts and especially the Broadway community when you are a public and uh, unapologetic Christian. Very interesting uh, interview with Hunter Ryan. All these are on Personally Speaking with Monsignor Jim Losanti. You go to YouTube, you punch in Personally Speaking with Monsignor Jim Losanti and, and please uh, subscribe and hopefully say that you like what we're doing. But it's just another way of seeing what people are all about in terms of their journey of faith and we can all benefit from that. Okay, let's pray. Lord.
Lord God, you feed us with bread from heaven. May we hear your Son always with the ears and the heart and the mind of faith and become your children, both in name and in fact. And we ask all of this in the name of Jesus the Lord. Amen. Amen. My friends, the Lord be with you. And with your spirit. And may Almighty God bless you and your families in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Our Mass is now ended. Let us go in peace. Thanks be to God.